Imagine you are traveling through the cosmos at the unfathomable speed of 326 million light years per second. Were such a thing possible and you were to look out a window of the passing cosmos, you would not see stars racing by, but galaxies, countless millions of galaxies, just as you were seeing here as we race to the edge of the visible cosmos. And if we should reach that edge, what then? Will we then go beyond the very matter and lights of existence into an impenetrable dark? And then, if we were to turn around, would we see the cosmos, all that ever was, ever is, or ever might be, diminishing into the distance? Or is there more out there, more universes, more realities, new physical laws? Such questions may be as old as time itself, they have certainly existed since the first human looked up into the scintillating lights of a darkened sky and wondered what those lights were and what they meant. I remember when I was a little kid and came across Carl Sagan's book, Cosmos. I read that book cover to cover and then discovered that a series had been made on it. And I watched the first episode to the last, as fast as I could. I was so in love with Carl Sagan's wonder at the cosmos that I actually cried at the end of the last episode and found myself also going out every night and looking up at the stars and thinking, what are they? And what is beyond? My family was poor and we grew up in farming country and I tossed hay and grew and sold produce and saved up every penny I had to buy my first telescope. And using the duct tape and the gumption of a kid that didn't know better, strapped a film camera onto the thing and took my first blurry, horrible picture of the sky that I was so proud of. And at nights when it was clear, I would look up through that telescope and wonder the same questions over and over. What is up there and what is beyond up there? Well, time has sure changed since those early days, and technology has marched on. I built the Sky Story Observatory, and NASA, well, NASA did their own cool stuff. And I think one of the coolest things they ever did was way back in 1995 when the Hubble Telescope took its first deep field image. Over the course of 10 days, the Hubble imaged a small point in the sky about the size of the head of a pin where you're to hold that pin out at arm's length. Many in the astronomy community up till then thought this would be a tremendously expensive misuse of the Hubble's valuable time. But that image, it was the image, the image that changed how we look at the cosmos forever. It revealed hundreds of heretofore unknown galaxies billions of light years away. And in the realm of astronomy and cosmology, this was breathtaking. Because up until then, astronomers thought that if you looked out to the edges of the universe, matter, galaxies, would be sparse, few and far between if there were any at all. It was thought the Big Bang had happened and most of the matter was concentrated in the central and mid regions of the universe. But there, at the very edge of all we could see, were countless galaxies, thousands, and suddenly, the eyes of mankind were open to the cosmos in ways they had never been before. These images revealed the deep field, the far deep cosmos, and since then many other deep field images have been taken. Technology continued to progress and cameras on the Hubble telescope were upgraded, and newer, more powerful telescopes such as the James Webb were launched, each one opening up new eyes on the cosmos revealing galaxies at the visible edge of the cosmos. And since space expands faster than light, allowing us to look back in time and see the universe near the dawn of its creation. But the question began to occur to me, can I do this from the ground? Technology has come so far. How far can amateur astronomers push the limits of what we have available from the ground, from right here on Earth? And so this year, I decided to begin the Sky Story Observatory's own deep field project. Though, I have to admit, the atmosphere is something of a barrier, in particular because this has been the cloudiest winter I can recall in at least a decade. 
Since the start of the cold weather, I have gotten an average of three good nights per month, and in all but two months, those nights occurred directly on the full moon. And that is a big problem with deep field imaging. Because in deep field imaging, we are trying to capture objects that are billions, even tens of billions of light years from Earth. And because of that immense, nearly unfathomable distance, those objects are very dim, millions, and perhaps billions of times dimmer than the human eye can perceive. And so began the Far Deep Cosmos project, my own efforts to shoot the deep field. Now, clear moonless nights are extraordinarily precious, as every astrophotographer knows, and I was reluctant to invest a clear night in something so uncertain as attempting to shoot the deep field. So for my first image, I decided to shoot a more certain target at the same time. A target that many of us, at least those of us in the Northern Hemisphere, know well. The dramatic starburst galaxy, Messier 82. This galaxy is being thrown into chaos by gravitational tides caused by the nearby, larger Boats galaxy, transforming the core of Messier 82 into a forge of star formation. In the core of that galaxy, stars are forming ten times faster than they are forming in our entire galaxy, releasing tremendous energy which leads to the eruption of the dramatic gases for which the Messier 82 galaxy is famous. And I was very happy with the results of imaging this galaxy over ten dark nights. But an analysis of the image revealed excellent results capturing the deep field all around the Messier 82 galaxy. A plate-solving analysis to analyze the deep field revealed 131 galaxies hidden in the far distance, including Quasar 2XMM J095752.6 plus 693227, which is 21.5 billion light-years on the other side of the cosmos. That's almost halfway to the edge of the visible cosmos. But I have to admit that this particular part of the image was my favorite. These are two galaxies, 2.8 and 3.7 billion light years away. And just to the left of both of them, a quasar, 2.9 billion light years away. Possibly three siblings related by the birth of the cosmos, racing into the far distance of the universe. This was taken from a region of space around the Messier 82 image you just saw, a region, like the Hubble image, about the size of a grain of sand, where that grain placed upon your finger and held out at arm's length. And it suddenly was confirmed to me that in fact I could use a ground-based amateur telescope to image the deep field. And I was hooked. But after those eight gloriously moonless nights that allowed me to image the region around Messier 82, the weather refused to cooperate. While six more clear nights did happen over the preceding two months, they happen in two groups of three days, and both falling directly over the full moon. Nevertheless, I couldn't wait to peer to the deep field again. But I had come to realize ages ago that if color was deprioritized, much moonlight information could be salvaged. So, I identified a new area likely to reveal a rich field of distant galaxies, and shot the area over two nights using the luminance filter only for almost all the imaging. Though I did run a couple brief RGB sequences while the moon was still below the horizon. This allowed me to get about two hours worth of color data. Just enough to inject a little pleasant color into the image. Even combating the challenges of moonlight, the imaging was a success. And plate solving revealed hundreds of distant galaxies also in this region. Those are the brighter ones automatically annotated by way of astrobin. But zooming in reveals so much more of incredible interest. Notice all the faint blotches of light in this image. Here, here, and here. These are regions where there are other galactic structures and other objects as well, waiting to be revealed. They just need more integration time. Though of course, darker skies would absolutely be a tremendous help. There are hundreds, perhaps thousands of deep field galaxies, quasars, and other objects waiting to be revealed in this area of sky. Sadly, while waiting for more good weather, this region moved out of ideal positioning in the sky. So I identified another region of interest. And, recognizing that so much of what I was trying to image was so, so extremely dim, I committed to waiting to shoot only when the conditions were ideal. The next region would be NGC 4874, a region of sky that has two distant but brighter galaxies right in the center. So far, I have imaged this region over three nights. One night devolved into cloudiness after six hours and yielded four good hours of integration. 
One night was extremely windy and six hours of imaging only yielded one hour worth of good integration due to vibrations induced by the wind in the telescope. But the final night, the final night was ideal. There was only a thin sliver of moon, though even that I regretted. But the weather was perfectly calm, the sky was clear as a bell, and the guiding was excellent. And 7.5 hours of imaging that night yielded 6 hours of ideal subs. That gave 9 good hours of good integration using LRGB. And 9 hours worth of LRGB integration under a dark sky yields a lot of information. So, from that, this image was integrated. This is the region around NGC 4874 and is roughly 30 by 30 arc minutes in width and breadth. That's about the width and breadth of the full moon. And contained within this image are 2,815 galaxies. The furthest is H Atlas J1300004.7 plus 281610 at 19,938,000,000 light years away. Doing an annotated plate solve on the image reveals the locations of these many galaxies. That's a lot of annotation, isn't it? So much, if we're going to be able to read any of it, we'll have to zoom in a little. There are also within this image 28 confirmed quasars. Let's take a look. The furthest one is J125842.87 plus 281314.8 and it is 21,116,000,000 light years away. It's in the top right of the image, right up here. But perhaps the most fascinating thing revealed in this deep field image of the far deep cosmos is less obvious. There are 13 incidents of gravitational lensing in this image. Let's zoom in and have a closer look. This one is my favorite, because of all of them, it is the most defined in the information I've been able to gather so far. So, what can you take out of this video? Well, if you are interested, there is a vast, vast cosmos out there, just waiting, beckoning to be explored. I read once that it was estimated that if scientists devoted all of their time to imaging the deep cosmos, it would take 900,000 years with all the professional telescopes we have presently on Earth and in orbit. I wonder what difference we amateur astronomers and astrophotographers could make were we to turn our attention to that task. And this is a task I think you should be excited about. This is a task where almost every new image is going to offer the prospects of new discoveries. And with those discoveries, new opportunities for learning new opportunities to contribute to the body of scientific knowledge. It is a realm of astrophotography where I think every new image can create new opportunities for discovery. And it puts you and your telescope on the threshold of a new frontier. And if that isn't inspiring, then what is? Because to me, this is why I got into astronomy and astrophotography to begin with. There is a vast cosmos out there and all we have to do is point our telescopes at it and keep integrating and integrating and integrating. And the longer we look, the more will be revealed. Now, doubtless some persons will have technical questions about how I shot this, and I don't claim to be the world's greatest expert, but I'll share what I know. If at all possible, you need to shoot from dark skies because many of these deep field objects are broadband emitters. That's not to say that you couldn't image them with narrowband techniques, but narrow band restricts light passage, it would certainly take longer. I think much longer. The very best technique would be to forget about color and just shoot on the luminance channel. Because a monochrome camera operating only on the luminance channel operates a full f-stop faster than a one-shot color camera, which means it gathers information twice as quickly. That's why images shot on the luminance channel always look so information rich compared to the combined RGB. But the color does look nice, so my next recommendation for the most efficient information gathering is shoot an LRGB. And if you don't have a monochrome camera or LRGB filters, don't let that stop you. You can still do this with a color camera. It'll just require more integration time. 
And this is one of those instances where I think camera cooling is going to be really important. In deep field imaging, you're going to be going after objects that are very, very dim and very small, simply because they are so far away. And I think it would be useful to get as much noise out of the way as possible to help your software process the information well. And this is an area where focal length matters. It matters a lot. You're going to want to shoot high focal length. Otherwise, the deep field objects that you're imaging are going to look small, maybe a little bigger than stars, but they're going to be very small. My suggestion would be to think of a thousand millimeters focal length as a starting place. The images I've shot so far have been at 1280 millimeters focal length. As far as exposure times go, I only shoot 60 second subs and sometimes shorter. I've weighed the advantages versus disadvantages to shooting longer exposures and as far as I'm concerned, it is highly advantageous to shoot shorter exposures. The amount of exposure time doesn't really matter for astrophotography anyway. It's integration time that's all important. Each sub will capture more light information and that light information will be added into the total image during stacking. By shooting shorter subs, you'll be able to minimize the problematic effects of things like a night breeze blowing causing vibrations in your telescope, guiding errors, atmospheric problems, or if you get a problematic sub such as an aircraft with very bright lights passing right through the center of your image, if you shot short subs, you can discard that information and not worry about it. It's only a few seconds, maybe a minute or so of integration after all. So don't worry about shooting shorter subs. Shoot them as short as you feel comfortable with. My personal rule of thumb is that I keep exposure times only long enough that I can visually distinguish most structure within any individual sub. That allows me to give them a visual inspection before calling with the subframe selector and sending them to stacking. As to total integration time, in this case, the more the better. I have nine hours right now on the NGC 4874 region, and I'd like to get three or four times that before I'm done with this project. If you have any thoughts, observations, or questions, please let me know. And if you're thinking of diving into the adventure of shooting the far deep cosmos and exploring that deep field, hey, let me know that too. I'm glad you watched, and I hope you find the prospect of deep field astrophotography just as exciting as I do. Now, Get out there and shoot that sky.